I'm Joanne Britton, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our Open Wednesday Bucket Course. Before I introduce our speaker, who probably needs no introduction anyway, I want to remind you please to turn off your cell phones and turn on your T-coils. Now, I am very happy to introduce to you Jim Arns, Professor of History Emeritus from uh, the Wentworth Academy Junior College, speaking to us this morning on Winston Churchill, man of the 20th century. Jim. Churchill this morning. Uh, this is uh, every year I do something like this or I have in the past. I think this will be my last time on an individual. I've done T.E. Lawrence and uh, 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 Sherman and uh, this one is Winston Churchill's time this time. I do this because I learn a lot about uh, what that person did and what he was, and his, uh, I enjoy doing this sort of thing, giving uh, presentations, but uh, we'll probably see this was be my last one here. Uh, there's only one other one that I would like to do, and that's the one I've done before, and that's on World War One. but that was a four-session four, uh, course. Uh, his uh, biography, his early biography, called My Early Life, A Roving Commission, is, I think, my favorite of all of his books. And he uh, wrote a whole bunch of them. Uh, you know, I've got a figure later on that I can remember. But uh, that, in that one, he specified that he had verified the uh, records of all the incidents in his career and his earliest memory from the early age of four was that of his grandfather speaking with the Duke of Wellington, who was the victor at Waterloo in 1815. So he went back quite a ways. Uh, Churchill was born, by the way, in uh, 1874. Uh, he would have an interest in war from that time on. And I can credit this because I have two memories from age five that I can recall. Uh, both of them were radio broadcasts. One of them was uh, the death of Franklin Roosevelt, who was the president. And the other one was the announcement of the end of World War II in Europe, yeah, VE Day. Uh, Winston himself was the son of Lord Randolph Churchill, who was the third son of the Duke of uh, Marlborough, who had married uh, Jenny Jerome, who was the daughter of an American businessman in New York named Leonard Jerome. And he was always proud that he was half American. And Winston's full name was Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, grandson of the seventh Duke of Marlborough. The first Duke was uh, John Churchill. Uh, several years ago, 
quite a few years ago now, I guess, um, Masterpiece Theater did a thing on the Churchills, the first <coughs> Churchill, and uh, it was an excellent program. The first Duke, John Churchill, was the victor at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. And Winston was born in Blenheim Palace, which was built for the uh, first Duke by the nation. This is the only one they ever built strictly for gratitude. Uh, he was, by the way, two months early in his debut on the scene. And the Battle of Blenheim is uh, very important because it marked the early success of the British entrance into world power in modern Europe. They were recovering from the malaise that had gone on after the English Civil War and they started to venture out into the world, and boy, they did so. Churchill was awarded a dukedom, which is one of the highest levels of hereditary nobility. This was the era of English class stratification. Winston was a typical product of the system of nobility. He was educated at boarding schools, which could be cruel. Harold was his last secondary school, and his parents, especially his father, paid little attention to him, uh, unfortunately. Uh, he was an adventurous, very adventurous child, probably seeking attention, and was thus accident prone. Uh, at one time, he fell off a 35-foot wall, or, uh, bridge and uh, injured himself so that he was unconscious for a number of days and took about three months for him to get back to to normal active kid stuff. He was closest not to his parents but to his nanny, Mrs. Edwards. Um, and when she died he was uh, notified and then made a trip back to uh, England from uh, the United States where he happened to be at that time. Uh, his father died in 1895 at the age of 45 of the degeneration caused by syphilis. He has obviously been doing things he probably shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> this is his family, his mother and his brother Jack, and Winston's on, the, uh, on her right. And this was Lord Randolph. And this was Winston as a schoolboy. And as a Sandhurst cadet. Now, Sandhurst is the equivalent of uh, West Point in British uh, in parlance. It's a college, and uh, they have some very fine instructors there. We once had a guest instructor that uh, had come, David Chandler, who had come from uh, Sandhurst, where he was teaching, and this was at a short course I was going through at uh, West Point. And uh, he had a great many insights that uh, I very much appreciated getting. He was probably a serious student of military affairs, and uh, he graduated eighth in uh, 150 and chose the cavalry out of uh, Sandhurst. But he didn't get into Sandhurst easily. It took him three different tries before he passed the exams that were necessary and got the appointment. But he was a serious military man from that point on. Now his father had wanted him to go into the infantry as uh, horses are very expensive, but he was then commissioned into the uh, Hussars, which was uh, cavalry, and they had to keep up their uh, effect in the cavalry with fancy uniforms, as you can see there, and horses that go along with it. And not only do you have to have a horse to ride, you've got to keep him someplace. 
that gets to be very expensive. But uh, Winston was still the adventurous sort all through this time, as he was commissioned. Uh, and he went into wars at, uh, as an observer many times at uh, Cuba and the Northwest India and in Afghanistan. And the tribesmen that uh, he encountered there were as fierce as they uh, were to the Russians and to the Americans today. Uh, you've got to uh, have a certain amount of respect for people that play polo-like games with a calf's head. Uh, he learned the English language extremely well. And uh, you, I'll give you a chance to uh, hear some of his, uh, when I read you a uh, message over Christmas time, the friend that he delivered from the White House at uh, 1941. And you can think of all the things that have been going on in that year. But uh, this writing that he could do uh, enabled him to uh, supplement his income because uh, he was always short of money. As you can well guess, there he is in his cavalry unit and playing polo. Uh, he's got his uh, right arm strapped to his uh, waist because he had injured it very seriously, dislocating the shoulder, and it bothered him from then on. Well, he was uh, jumping from a boat into the uh, dock when he first got to India. I, I'm not sure how he would swing that mallet to hit the little ball that's rolling along the ground uh, from a galloping horse. Must be quite a skill to uh, play polo. <coughs> well, while he was in Afghanistan and India and these other places as an observer, he managed to get permission to forward articles to newspapers and thus became pretty well known. Uh, that does not happen to this day in, uh, in the modern day army. Uh, you, don't let, you don't go writing for publication on your own until you've retired. <laughs> then it's safer. But uh, he had to do this in order to supplement his income. Uh, I, he always managed to do that, and uh, there were uh, all together over a lifetime. He produced 43 book-length works <coughs> and 70 in 72 volumes. So it makes him uh, pretty popular in English society. And uh, he developed an instinct, instant interest, which is really an obsession, uh, in politics, just like his father. Uh, his father had uh, served in Parliament and then had resigned as a result of a dispute with the party hierarchy. But uh, he had much more electoral success. But initially he didn't get elected first until after his uh, army service and um, he then went to South Africa. This is uh, him in South Africa as a correspondent. Uh, the Dutch farmers down there, the Boers, were resisting British intrusion. And the British, of course, were trying to mine the uh, gold and the diamonds, which they had discovered. And uh, they, were, uh, they were somewhat unpopular among the Dutch farmers who had been there ever since the start of the eight the 19th century and British imperialism was uh, pushing to seek out the riches from farming and mining interests. As always, he went beyond the duties of a reporter and gained a great deal of exposure during this time. He managed to talk his way out of a jam for interfering with the uh, 
the war effort down there because he was a civilian. He was he was not on active duty. He was an intruder, and he could talk his way out of all kinds of things. Could have been shot for that at the time. Uh, he escaped from the prison camp after being captured by the Boers, and uh, he they were three guys who were going to try and get out together, but only he made it out. The uh, guards. Uh, uh, the guards managed to uh, thwart the other guys with him. Uh, but he finally made it to neutral territory, having found just the right uh, sympathetic English-speaking people. And it got a great deal of publicity and was elected to Parliament uh, from the Liberal Party, and his political career was off. And he joined a territorial unit, which is what we call a reserve unit, and he kept current with this until he retired and collected his pension at uh, age 50. He was always needing money at a pretty high lifestyle, and uh, the pay he received when he wrote books, and because he wrote books, uh, pay for Parliament didn't come in until 1911 and was minimal at 400 pounds a year, or about $2,000 at that time. And the rate lasted until 1937 and was even reduced during the Depression years of the 1930s. And he married in 1908, Clementine Hoshi. And uh, this proved to be probably the best move he ever made. Their marriage produced five children, four of whom lived until maturity. One died in about three or four. And Clementine proved to be his greatest asset. She lived 12 years beyond Winston. But she was younger when she uh, did, when they did get married. And he always called her Clemming. And he, as a successful politician, was promoted to capital office in uh, cabinet office in 1908. He was president of the Board of Trade, which is somewhat equivalent to the uh, American Secretary of Labor. But then in 1911, he was appointed the First Lord of the Admiralty. And there he is with the First Sea Lord. Now, the, the British Admiralty worked, there was a civilian head, a politician. He was First Lord of the Admiralty, which is, of course, ministers of the Royal Navy, which is British finest uh, service, or the most important one in the time frame. And the first sea lord was the service member who was the actual operational head of the uh, Royal Navy. And it's during this time that uh, Winston made a lot of uh, progress in a political career. Uh, in 1915, he was dismissed from the position and then, as a result of the fiasco of the Gallipoli campaign, he had masterminded that in 1915, and it was highly unsuccessful. Probably the biggest problem they had was that, uh, well, it was twofold. They, the Turks were fantastic fighters, and particularly on their own ground. We found that out dealing with the Turks in Korea uh, when our units fought alongside them. Uh, the uh, North Koreans at that time during the Korean War greatly feared the Turks when they were in operation. But uh, during this time, he had to take the blame because he had masterminded the uh, uh, invasion of the Turkish opening to the Black Sea, which if it had been successful, 
would have opened the ways for the Allies to get their uh, supplies and assistance into the Tsar's Russia through the Black Sea. Uh, while he was also First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, he, uh, excuse me, as First Lord, as Lord of the First Lord, he, as and his assistant uh, managed the conversion from coal-powered ships, and that's got many disadvantages of storing uh, coal and handling it. And you can imagine getting the coal to refuel a ship of uh, steam power over a long period of time. If you're going to have any range at all, you've got to have a lot of coal. And coal is dirty. It's extremely dirty to handle. And so they were all high, highly interested in going over to a new fuel, and that was oil. And he was responsible for the English involvement in the Middle East oil fields by the Anglo-Persian oil company for about a 20-year supply on a secret contract they had uh, arranged for. He was always out to be on the ground floor of uh, innovation. He oversaw the development of British tanks. And again, not exactly something you would expect the uh, head of the Navy to be doing. But uh, he stuck his nose into all kinds of things like this. But after he was forced out, when he was asked for and received his resignation, he wangled command of a battalion on the Western Front of World War I. And he was very effective as a leader of men in combat until he returned to the duties in Parliament because they called him back. They wanted him to come back and become the uh, Minister of Munitions, the one who was responsible for producing all kinds of uh, ammunition and firearms and so forth, and he got an immediate increase in his output from those factories for 20%. So they were happy to get him back. In uh, January of uh, 19, 1919, he was appointed as Secretary of State for War and took on the portfolio for air. And he learned to fly on his own, taking lessons. This, of course, yielded a great deal of concern from his wife, who was worried about uh, the rather rickety state of aviation in those days. But he did survive, and he was m very instrumental in developing civilian applications of, uh, of aviation, both military and civilian, and he was much against, while he was in cabinet, of the Irish War of Independence and the Secretary of State for the Colonies in 21. Uh, here's his uh, French allies, where he's there right in, in uh, the center, about five from the uh, left. And in, after his uh, dismissal, there's a picture of uh, Winston and his dog Rufus, a standard-sized poodle. Uh, I don't much care for his hairdo. <laughs> but uh, evidently Winston did because uh, he had a succession of, uh, of poodles with that same name. The, the cigar. Pardon? The cigar. Oh well, that goes with it. When he went to observe that war in Cuba, and uh, that was you know, the one before, just before the United States got involved in that, he discovered Havana cigars and had an enormous taste for them for the rest of his life. I suspect he probably smoked until his dying day. But uh, as Secretary of State for the Colonies, he worked to try and retain three Navy bases that they had in the Irish Free State when it was set up. 
He lost out an election in 1923 and came back into Parliament in 1924, which and became their Chancellor of the Exchequer, an equivalent of our Secretary of the Treasury in Stanley Baldwin's government. And he was now back in the Conservative or Tory party. And as a result of this, uh, he had uh, engineered a uh, return to the gold standard, and that hurt the economy considerably. And uh, he regretted from then on why he had listened to people that thought gold was such a great answer to economic difficulty. Well, he was at his low point here when you see him in that, uh, in that uh, photograph. This is where he started to warn, though, against the uh, popularity of Hitler and his Nazi government in Germany, and um, he warned them in vain, I guess, of the danger to the whole world. Nobody listened to him, and these are the years out of office. He's a member of parliament, he attends and votes like any other member of parliament, but uh, he is not in a cabinet position. And he's waiting for the call to get back into uh, government if possible. This is the years in which he wrote histories of Marlboro and World War I and a history of the English-speaking peoples. The last one, the history of the English-speaking peoples, didn't get published until after the war was over. But uh, he had written it during the time when he was uh, out of favor. And he had a great deal of support from his family, and he remained a Tory politician throughout this time. And he abandoned in that time frame some of the positions that he had had, such as universal suffrage and a return to the property qualification for the franchise and a proportional representation for large cities. But during these years, he also opposed uh, people like Gandhi in India and resist the granting of domain status to uh, India, and starting in 1932, he opposed the law with Germany and Italy to rearm, uh, and was, it was now under the fascist uh, dictators, Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, and he began asking for the British to take, wake up and to rearm after everything had been cut back after World War I was over. And he had been a long-term opponent of socialism and communism in the uh, Soviet Union, and he even developed a rather ambiguous attitude as one who would praise Mussolini as an anti-communist. And there were those in uh, England who would call him selfish and an egocentric. But you have to look at it this way. There, he was tending to look after his own position to the exclusion of other considerations. But like most humans, particularly politicians, he took his stance based on his own interests. He gave credit to Hitler as having restored Germany to pride in itself, even though he believed in and advocated from 1934 on a drive to rearm because he's oh, the European dictators were a real threat to not only uh, England, but the whole piece of structure of Europe. He wrote uh, articles condemning communism. It was his old holdover from anti-Bolshevism of the uh, 20s. And he didn't condemn Mussolini or the weak support of the French politician Laval, uh, spelled L-A-V-A-L. Uh, when I took uh, contemporary history up here at Grinnell College from 
Homer Norton, some of you all may remember him, uh, he said that uh, Laval was somebody you couldn't trust. Anybody whose name could be spelled the same front and back <laughs> couldn't be trusted. I always thought that was something that uh, stuck with me. Winston's attitudes toward fascism would harden though as he saw that the threat to Britain was likely to undergo. And he condemned the appeasement policies of the Prime Minister. At that time it was Neville Chamberlain. He was the fellow who went to Munich to confer with Hitler and Mussolini and came back waving a little piece of paper that says we're going to have peace in our time. And Churchill didn't quite believe that. But he was still a member without office, and he remained a patriot. But he did do one good thing for all of us in history. He uh, collected all the documents that came his way, and he filed them away, and he kept it, and he could document practically any response to the uh, issues that came along during the day. He eventually had enough that he could write about most any issue from what he had in his own files. Of course, a lot of this is uh, slanted in his own favor, and that's only to be expected of a politician. And during this period of his life, he kept up and never hesitated to express his opinion. This is where he wrote the biography of John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough. And that, by the way, is considered to be one of the best historic biographies that was ever written. Even though it was, had definitely a natural bias <laughs> towards his uh, forebear. And he was a master of the written as well as the spoken word. Uh, his writings throughout his uh, whole uh, lifetime would uh, would be enough to fill all kinds of volumes of, I remember I said we had 72 of them all together, both in-house and post-death. post, post, um, post death. Um, He was regarded as his, uh, as being highly unreliable and difficult to work with uh, by his contemporaries. For example, he opposed any independence uh, for England from for India from England, and any change in his domestic status. He also was close friends with uh, King Edward the Eighth, and uh, Edward the Eighth wished to marry an American divorcee, and Winston supported him in opposition to many politicians, uh, clergy and citizens, until the king abdicated. These are some of the issues that people that were involved with. There's Gandhi on the left. And he was eventually turned back to when Winston was reappointed as First Lord of the Admiralty. In 1940, when the war, or excuse me, 1939, when the war broke out, uh, Hitler had invaded Poland in 19, September of 1939. And when shortly after that, uh, Neville Chamberlain could not govern. He didn't have support in the parliamentary system, and so a change had to happen. And an American visitor reported in 1940, quote, everywhere I went in London, people admired Churchill's energy, his courage, his singleness of purpose. People said they didn't know what Britain would do without him. He was obviously respected, but no one felt that uh, he would uh, be prime minister after the war. He was simply the right man in the right job at the right time. 
this time being the time of desperate war with Britain's enemies, unquote. Well, Winston was 65 years old when he became Prime Minister. And he kept the resistance alive through the war. And he could speak to the nation in a way on the radio that no one else could. He could do it in a way that was far different from the way Adolf Hitler did it. And in uh, his uh, administration, he would seek to find a way that the British could go on the offensive. They were on the defensive for a long time in the uh, Battle of Britain. And he was uh, used, uh, I'll come for one last story. Uh, he used the V sign as a gesture of uh, defiance. Adolf Hitler, incidentally, said that he, and claimed that he had invented this uh, V sign. And uh, Churchill and the British Broadcasting Service uh, got together and they started their uh, in-between broadcast with a uh, V Morse code, da 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 da, and kept that up through the whole war. And Churchill managed to uh, use that as a morale builder at home. Uh, I don't know, how many of you know that story of what that actually means? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. In uh, Churchill's uh, gesture there, he's uh, giving the V sign with his palm pointed outboard. And in the British uh, uh, lexicon, I guess you'd call it, that is um, the equivalent of the American flipping somebody the bird. <laughs> now, if he'd have had it the other way around, it would have just been a sign, but uh, this other way had a good deal more of a meaning for the, for the British, and I don't know whether the Germans ever figured that out or not. <laughs> But I think we're just about time to break here. This is a good time to, to do it. For taking your seats. And we will continue learning about Winston Churchill. Jim? Get back on. Oh, uh, when Churchill was uh, reappointed to the uh, head of the Royal Navy as uh, First Lord of the Admiralty in uh, September of 1939. A signal went out to all the ships and all the naval installations in the world with just two words in it, quote, Winston's back, unquote. So you can see the uh, services had him uh, fully uh, in in their camp. He was uh, greatly uh, admired by all those people. Well, I'd say Churchill helped save his country by partially by his uh, relationship with Franklin Roosevelt. And that led to great respect. Winston had to give up his anti-communism when the British and the Americans needed to ally with the Russians in order to prosecute the war. That uh, was a given, because uh, the Russians had the largest army outside of the uh, Germans and the American and the British. And we didn't have much of anything under arms. And, and I forgot the, the exact number of it, but it was something under 100,000 in uh, at the very start of the war, before we started to expand it. Uh, we needed to ally with the uh, Russians as well, and 
he developed a strong relationship as well with Harry Truman during the last year of the war because uh, Roosevelt had died in April and Truman took over the war almost cold. He had not been uh, cut in on much of the information that uh, is now commonplace given to vice presidents. The meetings of the big three, uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin at uh, Yalta, set the stage for the next 50 years as the three structured the future of Europe and allocated the divisions of the Pacific region in the war. This has been a source of uh, great disagreement among various historians about the impact of Yalta and the arrangements that they had made. At the uh, end of the war, these three at Yalta had, had gotten together in order to uh, set up the relationships that would be in uh, peacetime. At the end of World War II, the British and the French had to sort out their own relationship in the Middle East. And it came down to a struggle between the two over the, what's called the Levant, L-E-V-A-N-T. You'll see that term used fairly frequently. It's for Syria and Lebanon. And the French, under orders from uh, de Gaulle, seized territories in Syria and uh, Palestine and used military forces to subdue people there and under orders with the de Gaulle there were well over a thousand casualties among the civilian population and in those Middle Eastern areas and the British forced the French back into their bases and stopped this uh, uh, fight between uh, the French and the civilians. And this precipitated a ferocious row between the two allies. The very same thing nearly happened with the Russians, but the election in 1945 results came to be known at the end of July, and the wartime coalition of uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin had broken up. And Churchill had to hand over power to Clement Attlee of the Labor Party. And Attlee had actually had considerable experience during the war. He was uh, Churchill's deputy because they had a coalition government between the parties in England, and that made a great deal of difference in working together because they uh, were much able to coordinate. So from 23 May to 26 July, the uh, Churchill government had been a caretaker government after serving nearly six years as prime minister. Because I think a lot of this happened was that Winston had not taken care of the domestic political needs of the country and during this time the economy had gotten into pretty bad shape. I'm not sure it ever has recovered from what it was before. And he then became the leader of the opposition for the next uh, number of years, uh, for about six years. And during this time, he encouraged the development of a united Europe. But it was actually the Marshall Plan, which was set up the uh, European Coal and Steel Community, which now has evolved into the common market that actually did this. Uh, Winston's Conservative Party won the general election of October 1951, and he became Prime Minister again until April 1955. 
Now, this second ministry that he had had to deal with uh, problems in the empire. British participation in the Korean War and the crises in uh, Kenya and in Malaya. The British Empire was starting to break up. And while Britain tried to remain its, uh, as strong as it had been, its status of uh, the third major power in the world, it just couldn't do it. The uh, position of the British was so weak because of their economic uh, problems after the war, it had just simply drained them. Churchill's health began to break down during this succession. He had at least six strokes. I've seen other, I've seen ones that say he may have had more than that, uh, but uh, he he had a lot of uh, debilitating health problems during this time. But this started out in uh, 1949 and increased in severity. But he was able to carry on. He carried on in politics and foreign relations throughout these years until he got to 1955. And then he decided he would accept a knighthood which was offered to him. Uh, the, uh, prior to that time, he had been offered a peerage, which is a higher rank, and that he thought that he could not govern as nearly as effectively from the House of Lords as is from the uh, House of Commons. So he refused this until he did finally accept this in, a, in 1955 and beyond. He would suffer another severe stroke later on. But in retirement, he received a great deal of honor. You're seeing there uh, the three main characters. Uh, there's Winston himself, the one behind him is Randolph, his only son, and his grandson, Winston Churchill, the second. And he is uh, now active in politics in, in Great Britain, as you would probably expect him to be. Churchill will go on and on until he gets uh, to age 90. And in January of 1965, he suffered his final severe stroke. So he had collected over those years many honors. A knighthood in 19... 1953 and a Nobel Prize for Literature for his many historical works throughout the years, especially those uh, six volumes on World War II, which is probably something that many people have read. The uh, uh, three volumes by William Manchester I think is probably as good a biography, and I think it's more extensive, particularly in the political realm where it gets extremely detailed than uh, the official biography of Martin Gilbert. The, um, my favorite, though, is still his early life. But uh, if you look at the volumes one, two, and three by Manchester, uh, Manchester had done all the research for this and then died before the publication of volume three. And Paul Reed took over with the uh, approval of uh, family the rest of the uh, publication work for his uh, The Last Lion Total. Well, I, I highly recommend that book if you can get through all of those volumes. And that is the last slide. Questions? So I'll give you plenty of chance to answer a question. 
Jim, do you see that there's the possibility of any human being duplicating the kind of effect on the rest of humanity that, that uh, Winston Churchill did? Well, personally, I, I don't think that there's anybody ever to ignore. This is the uh, uh, impact of Churchill on humanity, and the, could there be a replacement for him with a similar effect? And I rather doubt it. But uh, he was a man who was educated in the 19th century and in the 20th century turned it to politics and went into, uh, I think, into a situation that was goes from one war to the next. And he had positions of leadership that uh, he used in great, great grace. Uh, uh, in great success, I should say, I guess, because he's, uh, I think he's the man of the century, of the 20th century, which is why I, I arrogated that title. <laughs> yeah, John? At the end of the Second World War, his attitude toward Stalin, can you talk a little bit about that? And to, you know, he was anti-communist prior to the war, and then he cooperated during the war. What, how did he influence uh, attitudes toward Soviet Union after the war? Well, after, after the war was over with, he, uh, the, uh, the question is, and I have a tendency to go jump into it without repeating the question, uh, John was asking uh, what, uh, well, his attitude toward yeah. communism and the Soviet Union. What was uh, his attitude towards the Soviet Union and communism and socialism as a whole? He never changed his opinion on socialism, but he learned to get along with the socialists in that coalition government through the war. It was a matter of having to do this. Uh, he could not avoid it. In, British politics, uh, they've traded between the conservatives and the uh, socialists every so often, ever since the end of the, end of the war. I don't think that uh, his impact is, is going to be uh, any greater than it was during the war. Did he advocate continuing the war and taking Stalin out? end of the war, you know, I remember that, but I don't know if it's too back. You mean, uh, with the... At the conclusion of the war, he wanted to take down Russia, take down the Soviet Union. Well, he, like, I think, Roosevelt, both of them were very wary of what would happen with the Soviets if they decided to keep on going from the eastern border of uh, Germany on across France and taking over the rest of Europe. Stalin was desperate for a buffer zone. He tried to get that uh, before the war, but uh, he was in, by uh, and, and some sort of an alliance with, with Stalin, but uh, he was never able to do this. And everybody, I think, as, as I recall, reading about uh, this, that uh, it was very difficult uh, to stop the Soviets if they did, decided to carry on with uh, their advance across Europe into the rest of, of Europe. And that eventually, and it wasn't all that long, led to the Cold War. People, I think, were tired of fighting. And at the end of uh, 1945, the uh, situation in Europe was such that uh, it was ex exhausted. And we were pretty much exhausted in our support for it. Yeah, Tommy? Um, did, okay, uh, Church, did Churchill continue to oppose India's independence? And because 
India gained independence probably when Attlee was prime minister yeah, it in was 49, 48, 49. Yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood when the independence movement says she was asking about uh, what Churchill's relations were with India. Right. And I think he was a realistic part politician and a per as a realistic person that there was no uh, stopping the independence movement in, Great in India. There was a considerable famine, by the way, during those years right after the war in uh, India that uh, brought down a whole lot of people. And uh, I think that pushed it. Uh, let's see, who was first? I'll go ahead there. Uh, when you look at that particular period, the end of the war, mm -hmm. the end of the Second World War, it seems to me you had three major powers at the time that were functioning very pragmatically about what the world was. I don't think Stalin, by the end of the war, Truman, Churchill, had any great love for each other. But Russia was totally destroyed by that point. England was not much better off. The United States, you could say some different things, but there was a lot of pragmatism to be able to move ahead and hopefully maintain a peace, which is part of the development of the UN. Uh, as much as my reading of history is that Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill never loved each other. No. But there was no way there was going to be an end to that war without their pragmatically working together to solve the issues. And I, th I think that's, that's a, one thesis that uh, you could make and make that point, but I think exhaustion paid a big, diff big part in all of this in terms of people being fought out, used up, and at an end, their ideas of, of going forward with another conflict were, were just wasn't there. But that's sometimes the point of which brings pragmatism into reality. Yes, indeed. Yeah, ma'am? Um, I have a question, but um, for people here, and maybe some of you have been there, but my husband and I traveled to Fulton, Missouri, which is the home, and some of you may have already done this, which is the home of Westminster College. And after the war, Churchill was invited to come to Westminster by Harry Truman. Obviously, he wanted him to come to Missouri, Harry's home state, and speak. And there's a wonderful, wonderful museum there of all kinds of Churchill memorabilia, a reproduction of his office, and this is where he made the famous speech warning the world about um, the Soviet Union and coined the phrase um, Iron Curtain. the Iron Curtain. Yeah. And at that college, there is a large section of the Berlin Wall, which is very symbolic of the Iron Curtain. So uh, not too far from Grinnell, if you're ever out for a ride, it's a wonderful, wonderful visit, and um, obviously he foresaw what was going to happen with um, Berlin being divided up and, and things like that, so he was not trusting uh, the Soviet Union at all after the war. But it, it's a wonderful visit if anyone ever wants to do that. Well, I agree, and uh, it is uh, the, the building itself in which he delivered that uh, address is, uh, is there, it's, a, it's a, like a chapel, and it uh, is well preserved and so forth. It was built in England and piece by piece <coughs> moved over to that um, college and reproduced over there, so it's actually a building from Great Britain that was brought over. 
So, um, go, and not too far from Burnett. Yeah. Jack, um, my wife and I have traveled a lot over in Europe. And uh, after the Iron Curtain was taken down, we would have guys who would talk about the Russians coming in to get rid of the Nazis. But they forgot to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Stalin was, I think Stalin's big ambition was to derive a buffer zone between Europe and the rest of the world, and his rest of his world. And he wanted to have a way of absorbing any invasion possibilities from a rearmed Germany. Uh, the Russians had had two wars in that century, in the 20th century, in order to uh, uh, learn the lessons that uh, the Germans were not were not a uh, power that uh, you could uh, you could trust. I don't think Stalin ever had any illusions about that. Now, as far as whether Stalin was had ambitions to take over the rest of the world. I just don't think it was a, either a practical policy or that it was possible that uh, they couldn't go any further. After all, they lost 20 million people in that war. And they had much of their uh, industrial capacity in the Ural Mountains and west of there was destroyed. So they weren't anxious, I don't think, to conquer the world, given though Stalin's uh, ambitions to build a buffer zone between he and the uh, rest of Europe. Yes? Well, Churchill, you know, is quite a unique person, personality, but I'm curious, uh, did he have any heroes or role models that he fashioned himself after at different points in his life? Role models for Churchill to, uh, I'm not sure he could identify any one particular person that he identified with. I, I know he identified with his father. We thought his father had gotten a raw deal in uh, the uh, conflict that he had within Parliament before he uh, actually resigned and and died uh, very young, but uh, I don't think Churchill had uh, any role model particularly uh, that he you could pick out as being somebody who had greatly influenced him. He was a voracious reader and had. Uh, absorbed all kinds of things and had collected all this uh, collection of papers that uh, he had used later on in his uh, all of his writings. As far as a role model that he was following, I don't think that there, there was one. I think he pretty much, um, well, as he said, keep buggering on. <laughs> yeah, Gene? Of, of local interest, uh, I uh, have heard about uh, a famous, well, to some trip of Harry Hopkins uh, to Britain uh, at the time that Roosevelt wanted to get into the war but was politically unable to do it. Was Churchill the prime minister uh, at that time? Yes. Yeah, Churchill uh, was was prime minister during the uh, during the latter part of uh, what was it? started up in thirty nine. Yeah. I I think his wife made it possible for him to write. 72 books and whatever. <laughs> 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 give some credit to that person because he didn't read. Well, you could uh, say that uh, he deserved a lot of credit. I'm going to give you a sample here of the 
since we're at the end of our uh, fall semester here and our bucket courses, and uh, this was Churchill's Christmas Eve message in 1941. He had come to the United States secretly and delivered this address from the balcony of the White House. And uh, I think this is a perfect illustration of the kind of, and it's appropriate to our season ten, right now, that um, illustrates his uh, capacity for words. Quote, I spend this anniversary and festival far from my country, far from my family, yet I cannot truthfully say that I feel far from home. Rather it be the ties of blood on my mother's side with the friendships I have developed here over many years of active life, or the commanding sentiment of comradeship in the common cause of the great peoples who speak the same language, who kneel at the same altars, and to a very large extent pursue the same ideals. I cannot feel myself a stranger here in the center and at the summit of the United States. I feel a sense of unity and fraternal association, which added to the kindliness of your welcome, convinces me that I have a right to sit at your fireside and share your Christmas joys. This is a strange Christmas Eve. Almost the whole world is locked in deadly struggle and with the most terrible weapons which science can devise. The nations advance upon each other. Ill would it be for us this Christmas tide if we were not sure that no greed for the land or wealth of any other people, no vulgar ambition, no morbid lust for material gain at the expense of others had led us to the field. Here in the midst of war, raging and roaring all over the lands and seas, creeping near to our hearts and homes. Here, amid all the tumult, we have tonight the peace of the spirit in each cottage home and in each generous heart. Therefore, we may cast aside for this night at least the cares and dangers which beset us and make for the children an evening of happiness in a world of storm. Here then, for one night only, each home throughout the English-speaking world should be a brightly lighted island of happiness and peace. Let the children have their night of fun and laughter. Let the gifts of Father Christmas delight in their play. Let us grown-ups share to the full in their unstinted pleasures before we turn again to the stern task and the formidable years that lie before us, resolved that by our sacrifice and daring, these same children shall not be robbed of their inheritance or denied their right to live in a free and decent world. And so, in God's mercy, a happy Christmas to you all. The man spoke poetry, and he would write this stuff down when he made a commitment to a broadcast. He would write this stuff down in the midst of what he was doing, and he had this instinct to put together, I think he's probably the most uh, uh, pleasant writer I've ever read. Yeah, Ken? He was the only one we had other than FDR who was strangled by for this topic because he couldn't be coming out to fight uh, the work in that again. He was certainly the, uh, I agree, he was the only one we had that could speak in this way and to everybody throughout uh, the world, as a matter of the English-speaking world. 
Well, I'm going to end up a little bit early on this, but that's all right. I have a hard time to stay away from but right, uh, reading and writing about battles. <laughs> yes, boom. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, just for World War II buffs, um, I just got a notice. Um, the, another road trip, the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, on May 17th through the, through the 19th, will have a three-day program um, about the Memphis Bell, which has been completely restored. and. Um, the captain's son and daughter will be there, and there'll be a lot of uh, World War II memories of what the, this crew did, not only during the war, but after the war. Okay, thank you. The Memphis Bell is going to be on a commemoration and display in uh, Dayton. Air Force, yeah. At the Air Force Museum. Well, we want to thank you, Jim, for sharing with us this morning. Right. As Jim mentioned, this is our last bucket class until after the holidays. So mark in your calendar, January 10 will be the first new class of 2018. So before you leave, turn on your phones and turn off your T-coils and come back in January. Thank you all. <laughs>